knows my passion and where my power comes from. Uh, my power comes from mitochondria, as well as yours. And actually, every organ in our body, and almost every cell, contains these tiny organelles called mitochondria uh, that are inherited from our mothers exclusively. They contain their own DNA, um, and um, this encodes about 13 proteins, only 13 proteins, and more than 1,500 proteins are encoded by the nuclear genome targeted to the mitochondria. Evolutionary, these mitochondria are considered to be antient bacteria that entered into the developing cell, and this is actually the basic of our technology uh, in Minovia. Uh, mitochondrial dysfunction not only causes loss of energy production, but also result in very poor steroid hormone production, uh, non-control of uh, cell death, uh, senescence, telomere elongation, and, and so on and so forth, all are known as the underlying hallmarks of aging. So we do believe that mitochondria is one of the important hallmarks of aging because energy is, you know, life. And when you have mitochondrial dysfunction that actually results in multisystemic disorders affecting almost every organ system, as you can see here. But the diversity of diseases starts from rare genetic pediatric diseases all the way until age-related diseases. So how do you solve such a complex and, um, and, and heterogenic um, disease aspects? We chose to focus on one important uh, organ system, which is the immune system or the hematopoietic system. As we heard today, uh, the immune system plays a very important role um, in many aspects of health and disease and in aging. One of them, uh, we heard uh, several talks about the importance to remove uh, dead or senescent cells uh, from tissues. Um, and the role of removing these cells relies on the immune system or healthy function of the immune system. Uh, so the hematopoietic stem cells reside inside our bone marrows and they're responsible for the production of all kind of blood cells. Um, so red blood cells, platelets, and every kind of immune cells. Um, and therefore healthy and functioning hematopoietic stem cell is important for the fun function of this organ uh, and immune system. Uh, there is a very important role of mitochondrial function in hematopoietic stem cells. Uh, impaired renewal of the HSC uh, cellulose over in the bone marrow uh, happens when mitochondrial is dysfunctional. We can see a shift in the lymphoid and myeloid uh, balance, uh, meaning um, the, the body has very uh, hard time fighting infections and removal of diseased or damaged cells from tissues, uh, reduced ability to terminal differentiate to mature, uh, cell types, I will show you an example of erythroid in a second, that results in anemia, thrombocytopenia, uh, immune dysfunction, of course, and eventually we do know that all of these cells stuck in organs not being removed uh, cause inflammation, which is one of the hallmarks of aging, of course. Uh, in Minovia, what we realized uh, very early in stage is that we can develop therapies to improve mitochondrial function, but it will not um, show us any benefit if we cannot measure mitochondrial function and dysfunction. Uh, so the first thing that we did, in, we invested uh, in developing blood biomarkers uh, to measure the efficacy of our therapies. We are part of a very strong uh, uh, Israel Innovation Authority consortium uh, called the Liquid Biopsy, uh, where blood samples from patients are received, both he healthy control, aged control, controls, uh, and Alzheimer's disease, there are also some groups working on pancreatic cancers. And the idea is that every group, academic or um, industry group, are measuring different biomarkers and then correlations are made between different biomarkers. So we are the group of mitochondria, of course. Uh, as you can see here, we have samples um, received from the clinic from young healthy controls, uh, old healthy controls and Alzheimer's disease patients. You can see the di uh, ages, uh, diversity. Oops, sorry. This is, oh, I don't know what happened. Sorry about that, but uh, this graph is not apparent. But what you see here, we are actually measuring three different biomarkers. One is the complex one, complex two activity in a simple manner with succinate utilization assay. 
Mitochondrial DNA copy number is a way to measure how many mitochondria there are per cell, and ATP production, of course. This is the energy coin in the cell, that's what's important. When you look at the different biomarkers, you don't see such a big difference. Actually, it's quite obvious that maybe even number of mitochondria are increased in age controls, and that's not surprising because they try to comp compensate on the uh, loss of activity, perhaps. So the only, um, uh, what you <laughs> don't see here for some reason, is the graph that shows that the ATP is really reduced in, um, between the uh, Alzheimer disease and the age controls. Um, and the young and the Alzheimer disease control. So uh, that was the significant. But so it seems like it's not that um, uh, important. However, when you calculate how much energy is produced specifically by the mitochondria per single mitochondria, and that's where we, you start seeing the significant difference between young. Uh, and old individuals. So this is a, a very specific mitochondrial score that we calculate from these three parameters. So that means what's the efficiency of ATP production per mitochondrion in the cell. Uh, so the highest scores is given to the young population and all the others are really low. Our positive control is the population of primary mitochondrial disease patients, not surprisingly. So this patient population, this is a Karen Siren syndrome. This is a deletion in mitochondrial genome, resulting in a very severe pediatric disease, uh, a deadly pediatric disease. And as you can see, the mitoscore is very low in these patients relative to the uncontrolled. Alzheimer's disease in old individuals are very similar. The goal is to now try to raise this mitoscore function using the technology that we are developing. Uh, so the focus is on two different indications. That's a strategy that Minovia have taken in the past years. We are looking at one side at an ultra-rare um, pediatric mitochondrial, uh, genetic mitochondrial disease. Uh, this is, in our mind, uh, the best model to study age-related mitochondrial dysfunction. And on the other hand, we are looking at an age-related um, mitochondrial uh, dysfunction. Uh, specifically, we are looking at the bone marrow, as I mentioned, and at bone marrow failure disorders. Uh, Pearson syndrome is a disease where there is a, um, a significant deletion in the mitochondrial genome, resulting, as I mentioned, in a very severe uh, disorder that causes de death in, in very young age. And the first observation is sideroblastic anemia. These children are very anemic. Uh, they're blood precursor cells are not producing red blood cells, and therefore they are blood transfusion dependent, and eventually they develop a multisystemic disease. But the first organ that is, um, that is harmed is the bone marrow. Very similarly, in an age-related um, disease called myelodysplastic syndrome, there is also sideroblastic anemia. This is the accumulation of iron around the mitochondria observed in the bone marrow of these cells, resulting again in the lack of ability to differentiate to red blood cells and severe anemia. Those two diseases are our target indications, and how are we going uh, to solve them? First of all, we wanted to show that indeed using the mitoscore, mitochondrial uh, scoring, we can identify the myelodysplastic syndrome patients as mitochondrial disease patients. So the mitoscore shows that in uh, uh, non-MDS patients, the mitoscore is high. In low-risk MDS patients, the mitoscore is lower, a little bit higher in high-risk MDS. Uh, and eventually, this is, again, the combination of the three factors that we are measuring. So myelodysplastic syndrome, age-related disease, is a mitochondrial disease, actually. And what we are proposing is this treatment cycle of mitochondrial augmentation technology, MAT. Uh, our product is called MNV201. We are collecting hematopoietic stem cells by aphoresis from the patients after mobilization. And then we are enriching these hematopoietic stem cells with isolated young and functional mitochondria. Why young? Because we are using the youngest and healthiest source, which is the placenta, um, that is only like nine months old. <laughs> so that's in our mind the best source to use for uh, rejuvenating the hematopoietic system. Those mitochondria are ready to use off-the-shelf products, cryopreserved, qualified by different methods that we have developed. And eventually, the whole process of enriching the stem cells with mitochondria is a process that takes just 24 hours, and then the cells are washed. Only cells with internalized mitochondria are being infused. 
not before we make sure that indeed the mitochondria are inside the cells using our uh, methods. Uh, the cells are then infused back to the blood and they know to home by themselves into the bone marrow and start rejuvenating the bone marrow and the immune system. We have shown before that indeed these mitochondria go into the cells. This is the green label mitochondria here in this hematopoietic stem cell. And also that these cells can transfer mitochondria between cells in the bone marrow. So it doesn't end up with just the mitochondria going into the cells ex outside the body, but also they continue to transfer mitochondria in vivo. Uh, we can also use um, advanced technologies to look at the DNA of the exogenous mitochondria that we use, and we use a taxic, um, single cell ataxic, to identify an open uh, chromatin uh, uh, that indicates, of course, uh, genes that are transcribed, but also the mitochondria genome, because it's a kind of an open chromatin. So we can identify the augmented cell specifically, and about 50% of the cell population is augmented with foreign mitochondria, exogenous mitochondria that have a different sequence. That's how we identify it. And it goes up to about 30% of the population on a single cell manner, okay? But it's very diverse. Not all cells take mitochondria to the same level. And we are trying now to understand based on the different gene expression, what are the elements that will determine who, which cell will take up more mitochondria than others. Uh, and that is still work in progress. Um, we uh, then show that if we take uh, stem cells from uh, diseased uh, individuals like myelodysplastic syndrome, we show that they have diseased properties. So for example, their ability to, to differentiate to red blood cells is damaged relative to healthy controls. These are CD34 from healthy donor. Uh, and you can see how damaged this ability is and also their ability to in vivo um, reconstitute the bone marrow of a mouse is damaged relative to healthy control. And now the question is whether MAT can rescue uh, this damage. Uh, so recently, we started uh, two different clinical trials with our allogeneic mitochondria product for the first time in humans, and then we get access to patient cells uh, for the first time. And as you can see here, both Pearson syndrome patient cells and myelodysplastic syndrome patient cells show improved ability to differentiate your erythrocytes. Uh, the most important figure is this. This is the terminal differentiated red blood cells, meaning that mitochondrial augmentation actually improved the ability to terminal differentiate to erythrocytes. That's done in vitro. And then when we inject these cells to a mouse model, this is an NBSGW mouse model that can engraft human cells in the bone marrow, you can see this improved engraftment rate, improved stem cell rate in the bone marrow, and again, improved terminal differentiation of erythrocytes in the bone marrow. And also in the peripheral tissues, there, you can see that there is a high population of uh, terminal differentiated human cells. Importantly, those are low-risk MDS patients. They do carry a mutation that could cause AML, but they are on the low-risk spectrum. One of the questions we were asked is whether enrichment with mitochondria can cause cancer or can accelerate the progression to cancer. There is no scientific rationale to this because actually cancer cells have reduced mitochondrial activity. However, we said, well, if that's the main question that the regulatory agencies ask and the KOL, we have to answer that question. So first of all, in this mouse, there is a reduction in the mutation load. So don't worry about that. But then we, get, we went to the best in class, uh, Dr. Omar Abdel Wahab from Memorial Sloan Kettering. He has a mouse model uh, called the NHD13 that um, has an uh, accelerated aging uh, phenotype. And this mice die at one year due to AML. So the MDS progresses to AML. We took the stem cells from these mice and reached them with a the healthy placental mitochondria and then infuse these augmented cells into a healthy mouse that was irradiated. So it has space in the bone marrow to now engraft these uh, augmented cells. When we compare now the ability of these cells to repopulate the bone marrow, you can see what happened to the diseased stem cells. They are actually very poorly producing healthy stem cells in the bone marrow. However, the augmented cells produce very healthy and uh, very comparable almost to wild type. 
More surprisingly, these cells all produce leukemic cells. This is the 30, CD45 uh, negative cells, while the augmented cells have a delayed development of this AML marker. And that's how the survival curve looks like. Those are the mice that received wild type cells. Those are the mice who received the disease cells. They die within four weeks. And this is the survival curves of the mice who received mitochondrial augmented cells. So the answer is no, we are not accelerating AML. We are actually delaying AML progression and extending lifespan. And that's the goal. Um, we are using this uh, uh, methodology in patients. This is a summary of a previous uh, product. We are measuring the biomarkers. This is, for example, the healthy copy number of the mitochondrial DNA, showing improvement and increase at six months post-treatment. Uh, that correlates very nicely with disease severity scores. So they are doing better and their blood mitochondrial DNA increase. Uh, and as I mentioned, we have treated already seven patients with this program, uh, although we have mice data and um, in vitro cell data, but we are looking, of course, into this patient's follow-up times to understand whether we are changing their anemia, their need in blood transfusions, uh, and that would be our a hint into the future where we can actually expand from these rare diseases into more common ages, uh, diseases of aging. Uh, and we are looking forward to that. Um, as a hint, this is the first patient. We had the longest follow up for this one. She's doing better in terms of the disease severity scores. The lower is better. She's doing better in terms of her growth. She was going down in her BMI and then stabilized at six months and improvement in her blood biomarkers. This is ATP at six months, and this is copy number of mitochondrial DNA at six months. So we're very excited about this and looking forward to continue this research, and even submitting for the X Prize, which I think you will find very interesting. And the concept is to do the proof of concept with these biomarkers in these mitochondrial diseases, and then design the trial that would show us improvement in immune function, cognitive function, and muscle function uh, in this design of a trial. Uh, towards this uh, competition in the next seven years. Uh, thank you so much for your attention. Thank you.